I'm John Shiga. I'm the chair and associate professor in the School of Professional Communication. I'm Jessica Mudry. I'm associate chair and associate professor in the School of Professional Communication at Ryerson University. All right. You know, you know what, John? I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, what are you going to bring with you for your first visit back to your office? Because it's been almost a year now. <laughs> Good question. Um, well, I will be bringing a, I will be bringing a large bottle of hand sanitizer, um, <laughs> yeah. for sure. I, I, I used, I had, I have one still there, I think, but it's, it, it probably wouldn't do, do the job. We need to use it more often these days. So, um, there'd be that, um, what else, you know, probably something to open a lot of letters that are probably waiting there um, that need to be sorted through. I haven't been there since sometime in the summer, I think actually, in, in July maybe. So I would, I would be expecting, you know, a, a small stack of things that need to be sorted through. So yeah, letter opener, okay. yeah. <laughs> How that's, about you? That's good. Uh, I, well, in addition to a hazmat suit, right, similar to the hand sanitizer, um, I'm actually really looking forward to, so I'm, pr I'm probably going to bring like, like a lot of loose change, um, because I haven't used cash in, you know, the better part of a year. And so we've got loose change laying around and I am just going to go liberally distributing it to all the like cute little snack places and small independent businesses that, that I really hope will stay afloat because they yeah. keep us caffeinated and, uh, and sated while we're, we're professoring away so for sure um, for sure wait for that moment man that's a good uh, okay. idea yeah so so let's 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 crack on here and you know you and i are have been put together because we have um maybe not super overlapping venn diagram circles but overlapping enough that i think that that we can um we've got mutual interests in the uh the explanatory journalism project so i'm gonna I'm going to ask you about your research framework and, and maybe you can just sort of, you know, free associate here, but um, what's your focus when you're looking at explanatory journalism? Like what is, what is really the center of your project? The, the center of my project is really looking at some of the differences between explanatory journalism um, in the conversation or the, the version of it that the conversation is known for. And then other forms of explanatory journalism, which have been around, you know, for, for quite some time. Um, typically, they have names like analysis or something like that, right, to sort of signal that they're different than the uh, usual current affairs um, reporting. Uh, and so looking at some of the similarities and differences between them, because I think the conversation borrows uh, a number of uh, techniques that have been used by journalists and other, other media before, but it's also doing something, something different. So that's really what I'm interested in, as how the conversation is using its platform, um, uh, also addressing its, its unique audience in, in sometimes different ways than, um, than traditional news media. Um, so in terms, in terms of the actual case study that I'm looking at, it's, I, I decided to look at how certain concepts in virology are being popular, popularized during COVID-19. So I looked at the concept of um, reproductive number, which is a, a statistical way of, of looking at uh, how, on average, how many people are infected by one infectious person. Um, and so I was interested to see, you know, in terms of how scientific concepts are explained, how they're made to seem uh, relevant um, for, for helping us address uh, an issue or a crisis, but also the ways in which uh, numbers are used uh, in the context of, of popular or public communication around COVID-19 and, and reproductive number kind of does both of those things at the same time. So that's 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 it in a nutshell, and uh, and it's been really interesting because I, I see that as kind of a pilot project. You could look at all kinds of other concepts from virology and many other other you know sciences um, that have been introduced or popularized during COVID nineteen. But that's where I decided to start. And how about you? Um, can you give us sort of a sense of your uh, research framework and and the kind of focus of your research at this point? Sure. So. 
more or less are, I mean, ours are similar because we're both actually looking at scientific concepts and um, inst instead you kind of went general to specific, I'm going to go specific to general. So my specific project looks at the ways in which uh, data visualization presents itself in a variety of, of uh, articles in the conversation. And what I'm interested in is the, the sort of the topics or the, 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 you know, the focus areas, the academic focus areas that think it's important to put in the article in the content of the article, some sort of graphic representation of what the, as, as an explanatory piece, right, as a sort of add on, um, as a complement to the text. And so what we found in from a, our sort of preliminary, um, our, our preliminary data is that, you know, we're finding that in there are medical articles that you know, articles about, let's say, COVID-19 in its, you know, biological, viral, you know, virological, I don't think that's a word, but um, in, in the kind of medical examples and medical articles we find, and that shouldn't really be that surprising, um, graphs about data or bar charts or pie charts or these kinds of things. Um, but we also find them in articles about economics and interestingly enough about politics. So particularly the last one, it's interesting for me to see how the kind of scientific method and the, um, the reproduction of the scientific method as a structure of presenting information finds itself in places that aren't necessarily scientific. Um, and so that's the specific project. Broadly though, and, and I'm, I'm sort of alluded to that, I'm really interested in the ways in which academics either successfully or unsuccessfully write in a journalistic way. And what we're finding slowly and it's early days is that academics actually have a really difficult time writing in a non-academic way. And it's this, this the, the data really points to that. The data visualization really points to that. The best way for an academic in an academic article to prove their point is to just show the data to the audience. And in an, in an academic journal, the audience is, you know, a, a group of their peers. And that is a convincing argument. In a forum like the conversation, the audience is different, or at least the hope is that the audience is different. And yet the authors are still using those same sort of, of explanatory techniques that we would be using in academic articles, um, but for a different audience. And so maybe we need to think about what that means as academics and who are we really writing for here? So I think we're gonna explore issues of audience as well and you know, either be bang on in that we're actually just writing for other academics perhaps, but if we wanna reach a broader audience, then what is vis data visualization doing? Is it off-putting? Is it actually bringing more people in? Not sure. That's interesting. So um, in, terms of, in terms of writing for uh, non-academic audiences, um, what, what what do you think the the stumbling block is there sometimes in terms of is it just that um, is it just a matter of being so accustomed to a particular way of writing or is there is there something uh, you know else that makes academics a little more cautious about uh, writing like a journalist or or or, or writing like a, a social media influencer let's say what 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 what's, what are your thoughts about that at this stage. You know, it, it's interesting when, when we're both talking about scientific and even certainly in your R number case as well, this idea of the assumption is always when you're writing that your audience is literate, but the assumption is not always that your audience is numerate. Mm, and I think yeah. this element of numeracy is what academics take for granted, particularly in let's say economics or in, in the sciences and, and the medical professions when you're doing the writing. We assume numeracy, um, but I don't know that we can always assume numeracy to get the broadest audience. Right. So I think, and I think that that's probably one of those spots where our, our, our work overlaps here. Um, mm -hmm. The role of numbers and numeracy and, and you know, quantities uh, in, in academic writing. Yeah, yeah. How do, how, do we, how do we write that out? So that we can have a bigger audience. Yeah, and I guess I guess this gets to some something you know even even larger, right? Which is around the way that um, risk has been kind of communicated, right, to the public and all by all kinds of organizations. 
Um, you know, probably the most familiar data visualization around COVID are, are case numbers, right? The, the rise and fall, the curve, um, and so forth to do with daily cases. But, um, you know, that's not always necessarily the most important you know, thing to be looking at, right, at, at, any, at, at any, any given point. Um, and I think that's sort of where our number is kind of interesting to me. It, it sort of sits there in the background. It doesn't occupy nearly the same kind of uh, sort of center stage that, that daily cases um, has in the news media, but yet it's really important, you know, in terms of, in a sense, you know, um, it doesn't really matter, it doesn't tell us that much from what I understand um, as to how many hundreds or thousands of cases there are today, right? What matters is how many people are being infected by other people, right? That's, you know, that's really the indicator. Even if cases are going down, that reproductive number can tell a different, a different story. Um, but I'm also interested to find out, and this is going to be part of a lar the larger um, study, would be to look at kind of where um, our number creeps in and out of the news media. Like, are there particular points, right, in the in the pandemic where it does start to uh, get a bit more attention in the news media and, and why might that be? Um, but anyway, going back to your uh, other point about numeracy, um, in terms of the data visualizations that you've been looking at, uh, do you think that, do you think that they're, um, assuming too much on the part of the audience that they are able to to, um, to make sense of those numbers on their own, or or how how are you sort of looking at those at this point? I'm not at this point looking at sort of assumptions from the author around audience. More so in, in that way, in that kind of projected, you know, outward facing. More, I'm more interested in the thought process of the author when they sit down and say, I'm going to write something for the conversation. And I think it's really important that I put in this, you know, let's say X, Y axis with the line with outliers and countries and, 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 or projected curves. And so that kind of, of, again, that, that fluency with even just basic graphs, which I think, you know, depending on whether you're in epidemiology or public health or, let's say you do you do quantitative communication studies or geography there the assumption is that that is not going to be entirely off-putting to you you're going to be able to look at it even from a distance and go yeah that makes sense or it's going to be referred to in the text and you can glance over and go oh yeah yeah there's the justification for the claim so if i think about the process of argumentation and this is this is where I think both your work and my work can be easily transposed into a non-COVID case um, case study is that, you know, what exactly are we trying to do when we insert this as a justification for the claims that I'm making in my article? What assumptions am I making? And that tells us a lot about basic, like, you know, the structure of argumentation that, that academics have in their mind about how to write, full stop. And I'm not sure that that's the same sort of sensibility that a journalist would have. Right, right. Well, and that's that's interesting too, right? Because there's uh, increasingly, we see journalists playing a role that um, previously it might've been academics or other kinds of researchers playing, which is, you know, data journalism, right? Data-driven journalism and um, tracking down and and sorting out and and uh you know compiling sometimes huge amounts of data um and then and then trying to make sense of it for the public usually trying to bring in folks who who have expertise in the area to, to help do that but um you know that that is kind of seems to me anyway a, a new phenomenon right that you have journalists sometimes playing a lead role um in, in making sense of the numbers. Uh, and, and so I think that's kind of an interesting, um, it's sort of an interesting time then, right? To be looking at how numbers are communicated to the public. Absolutely. Um, so uh, in terms of the, uh, in terms of maybe we could talk about, so we've talked about some of the similarities are both interested in numbers, how they're communicated, how they're made sort of meaningful. Um, and who's doing the communication with whom. Um, but also what about in terms of some of the, 
differences that we've maybe between our projects. Um, I know yours is looking specifically at visual uh, communication on the one hand, and um, R can be translated and sometimes is into visuals, but it isn't always. Um, so maybe there's there's one difference there, right? In terms of so for you, what was the the kind of motivating motivating factor to to look closely at data visualizations um, in in, uh, in these types of news articles? I mean, for me, so. I mean, you know this, but I, I was an ex-scientist, right, where you would have to write reports, you know, any of your basic lab reports or even your, your scientific articles, which don't get, they don't hold any water unless they've got some sort of visualization of the data. Um, I mean, that's the one thing that I think is, for, for me anyway, I'm just, you know, we, we get stuck in that, and it took me a really long time before I could kind of write that out of my own writing. Um, but I do think that they're, a, a, you know, cheap and easy way to tell a story. And I'm fascinated by when people think it's important to trot those things out because they're very, um, they present themselves as quite objective and you know, we'll just let the data speak for itself. And a picture is worth a thousand words. I mean, there's a ton of cliches around that but they're cliches for a reason. Because I think that as a, as a sort of, as an, both an audience and a producer, you know that again, it's, it's, um, it's a, it's a point from which you can then argue, but it presents itself as though you had nothing to do with it on one level. So there's this way in which the science comes through you and the argument comes through you and is then presented as this nice little package that people see and process quite differently than you know words which are slippery and could have many meanings and and again it's the it's the um the subjective nature of language versus the objective language of numbers so that stuff's i mean it's it's super interesting to me and you know if we want to if we want to think about about methodology um you know i mean what i have to actually do and this makes it kind of meta is I actually have to count the number of articles and then codify and categorize in a very objective and quantitative way, the categories that I think these things present themselves in the most. So, you know, part of my method is in fact, almost a, a kind of reproduction of what I'm studying. And I mean, I, I like to be a little bit playful with projects and writing and stuff like that. So, so part of my own method actually comes and was inspired by the um the content itself so i had some students do a lot of that kind of counting and, and coding and again we ended up it ended up being such that we've got and i had some fantastic student researchers you know we we said well these are the three kinds of categories or topics of articles where these things present themselves um and you know i mean it was quite easy to do from um from a distance right and over zoom and things like that but uh, i'm wondering how did you develop a method and then how did you develop a method without being able to have like team meetings um well for one thing we kept our team very small <laughs> to make it manageable um so i just had i was working with just one uh research assistant over the summer so from that perspective it was easier to coordinate um and uh and uh I also was lucky enough to have a very uh, a, a wonderful uh, RA who was able to to uh, help not just um, collect the data and analyze the data, but also to help contextualize um, you know what we were what we were looking at within the literature. So that was I was really fortunate to have a research assistant with me from pretty much the the very early days of the project right through um the fall so that was that was great and it helped to kind of keep things um coordinated and it sort of helped the whole thing kind of cohere just having that kind of small stable team working on the on the data the the one thing that we did that it was a little bit different from what i normally do is we um, used a statistical tool to look at frequencies of different types of words um, which is a tool i know others on the team uh, have been using. And uh, I haven't done a lot of that kind of work before, but I was interested in, and open to, to, to sort of see what it was capable of doing. So what we ended up doing was we found that 
um, Luke, it's called, uh, which is the statistical tool that looks at, um, it does statistical analysis of, uh, of a corpus of different types of texts, and is really good at, um, at the, the number side, right? Figuring out how many instances of a certain type of word uh, it will find in maybe just a few articles or maybe hundreds or thousands of articles, and it can do it a lot more faster than um, than my research assistant and I. So to get, we, we use that tool kind of as the, the first pass, right? Sort of just getting a sense of what might be going on in those news articles. But we found we had to actually go in and look at them more closely to sort of see the, the, the degree to which it was making, um, making the call as to whether a certain word was going into a, a certain category. And sometimes we didn't agree. O oftentimes we didn't agree with the way it was categorizing. So we found there needed to be a human um, uh, kind of overseeing, right? The analysis and making the final call as to uh, whether something goes into a, a certain category or not. So one example of that, that maybe, maybe this is something that um, relates to your project as well, was really interested in uncertainty, right? And the degree to which uncertainty and experts are often uncertain about lots of things, right? And, and are at least in academic work quite forthcoming about that. In fact, it's, it's kind of an ethical thing. You need to uh, communicate the limits of your study and the limitations of your knowledge. Um, but sometimes that doesn't get uh, the same degree of attention, right? Once once we get into sort of popular culture or popular media. Sometimes those little ifs, ands, or buts, limitations of the study kind of get edited out and then things seem a lot more certain than they actually are. At least that's the impression the audience could get. So we were interested in tracking that in terms of, um, in terms of reproductive number and other kinds of sort of indicators around the risk of the pandemic, how much, how much uncertainty was communicated in news articles and in conversation stories. And, um, and so that was one of the, the, the areas where we didn't always agree with the, uh, with the software, right? That was doing the analysis because it was picking up words that might indicate some degree of uncertainty, like probable or maybe things like that, where it's not quite 100% certain. But depending on the context in which those words were used, they may have nothing to do with the topic that we were looking at, right? Um, right. In this case, uh, our number. So, so yeah, it did require a little bit of, uh, we had to kind of, um, the software needs some hand-holding, but it's a really, really useful tool as a kind of first pass to get a kind of general sense of what might be happening in the data. Um, so that was, so in, in, in a nutshell, it's kind of a mixed methods, I suppose, right, approach where we're doing, using the quantitative analysis, software assisted um, analysis first, and then we kind of go into the articles and, and do more of a qualitative um, human um, driven analysis of the, of the stories. How about you? How is, how does your methodology, how has that um, evolved over the course of the study so far? Well, again, I, you know, what we're, we're, what we're doing is really taking a kind of quantitative approach to quantitative data and then going to do a qualitative analysis, so a content analysis of that, you know, quantity upon quantity, which, again, sounds a little bit confusing, but it's pretty clear in our minds about how, you know, we're, we're looking at trends and we're going to have to, again, quantify those trends as to, you know, what are the kinds of articles that deem it important to then, you know, demonstrate through or prove their point through um, through data visualization. So again, it's, it's, I mean, I guess there's a bit of mixed methods in there as well. And I'm kind of hoping that um, we can maybe develop, a, and I spoke to another team member about this, develop a way of actually analyzing the visuals so like, a, you know, a kind of an AI system whereby we can kind of insert the picture and it can tell us patterns of, you know, as soon as we start increasing that number of pictures that we dump in, um, you know, here are the kinds of pictures that are most important or here are the kinds of pictures that are most prevalent in these kinds of articles, which I think is going to be interesting as well, based on the discipline of the author. Um, and 
And, you know, also just seeing like, what do people think that people understand in these graphs or what are the ones that, that they think might be most likely to be understood by an audience? Is it a bar graph? Is it, you know, an X, Y axis? Is it some sort of linear? Um, you know, I think that what we're finding is this idea of, of exponential growth is actually really difficult for people to understand. And that's why people, you know, when, when they say there's gonna be a spike, the trajectory is not a linear, it, it's not a linear relationship. It's not a straight line, like a ski slope. Um, it's much more like dropping off a cliff or having to climb up a sheer mountain. And I think that, and that's gonna be something that I wanna you know, look at down the road is thinking about the ways in which people perceive things like linear relationships versus exponential relationships as either more or less risky or um, you know projected case numbers or projected. I mean, we do this all the time in economics. Um, and so people's behavior actually, or even you know understanding of certain concepts are very much shaped by looking at a graph and going, oh, well, you know, see there was a dip that day and I'm sure the trajectory is gonna be in the same direction tomorrow. Well, depending on the R number, who knows, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. see what I did that's there? <laughs> <laughs> well done, yeah. Um, no, that's really interesting because what you're talking about is it, it brings in something for me. We have It hasn't been focused yet, but I, I would like it to become the focus, which is this kind of intersection with um, human interpretation and decision-making and agency, essentially, right? And so, um, you know, R numbers, Sometimes I think the the way it's communicated and sometimes sometimes the way it's framed is that it's this it's this thing that's kind of out of our control, right? This is what the virus is doing right now. It's um, but but what's sometimes not communicated very clearly is how many different factors shape are and whether it's going to be linear or whether it's going to be exponential, and that many of those factors are social. Right, it has to do with human behavior and you know policy making and all kinds of things, um, not just the virus itself. So anyway, I thought that was you know another another interesting um, intersection with 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 your work because you know when it comes down to it, it's uh, you know I guess one of the big questions would be what do people do with data visualizations, right? right. Yeah, and you know this is like it seems like both of us have got projects. Um, you know, if we're if we're looking forward, right, and thinking about future of of what we're doing, we're starting with something that that seems small, but I think both of of our projects actually lend themselves, as I mentioned before, to this sort of transposition onto a bunch of other different kinds of case studies, and also allow for some larger claims about explanatory journalism, academic writing versus journalistic writing, because I think that we both see probably the conversation as this space where both of those things have to happen. But by doing that, that also means that certain tendencies in, in academics who are writing for the conversation need to actually be dampened and other parts need to actually be, um, maybe exploited isn't the right word, but sort of embellished. And, um, you know, who's a better person to write about these things? Is it the academic expert or is it the journalist who goes and does the research about the topic and then does pull quotes from, from which is the current model for, act, for journalism right now? And, um, and I think that what, you know, what our projects do, particularly in the domain of science and medicine and is really think about because part of this is a public service on one level currently in the, in a pandemic right people need the right information but what to what level of sort of pre-digestion do they need because not everybody is numerate not everybody is is sort of up to date on medical ease um there's a certain amount of knowledge translation that has to happen and if it's done poorly then people are quite in the dark about what an r number is or you know, or what the, the outlying, you know, um, data points mean. So I think that that really, you know, going forward and, and thinking about the future of this project um, bodes really well for both you and I in that, in that we can take this to other places once, cannot wait, once life is back to normal. Right, yes. Well, let's fingers crossed that sooner than later. Mm -hmm.